Chapter 4b of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4b, Freedom of Self-Consciousness, Stoicism, Scepticism, and the Unhappy Consciousness. Translator's Note. The previous section has established the self as ultimately a free self, but even this is abstract at first, and hence the attempt to maintain it must pass through different stages. These attempts have taken an historical expression in European civilization, but these are merely instances of an experience that is strictly found in all mankind. Hegel, however, selects the forms assumed in European history, and has these in mind throughout the succeeding analysis. The terms Stoicism and Scepticism refer primarily to the forms which these assumed in Greece and Rome. The last stage of independent and free selfhood he names faux de mieux, the unhappy consciousness. The background of historical material for this type of mind is found in the religious life of the Middle Ages and the mental attitude assumed under the dominion of the Roman Catholic Church and the feudal hierarchy. The social and political dissolution of the Roman Empire has its counterpart in the mental chaos and dissolution of scepticism. The craving of free mind for absolute certainty and constancy amid change and uncertainty found expression in an organized attempt on the part of the Church to establish permanent connection between man's mental insecurity and an immutable reality. The two poles of this antithesis were far removed from each other, and the method or methods adopted to bring about the union reflect the profound contrast of the opposing elements. It is the inner process of free mind in this realm of abstract subjective piety which Hegel analyzes in the part termed the unhappy consciousness. Unhappy because craving complete consciousness of self and never at this stage attaining it. The end of this movement, and therefore the disappearance of all the one-sidedness of abstract individual freedom of self, is found when, through the above struggle, there dawns on the self the consciousness of its complete and explicit unity with reality in every shape and form. This is the beginning of the absolute sovereignty of mind, the consciousness of reason as supreme. The change to this new condition found historical expression in the Reformation and the Renaissance. End of translator's note. Independent self-consciousness partly finds its essential reality in the bare abstraction of the ego. On the other hand, when this abstract ego develops further and forms distinctions of its own, this differentiation does not become an objective, inherently real content for that self-consciousness. Hence this self-consciousness does not become an ego which truly differentiates itself in its abstract simplicity, or one which remains identical with itself in this absolute differentiation. The repressed and subordinated type of consciousness, on the other hand, becomes in the formative activity of work an object to itself in the sense that the form, given to the thing when shaped and moulded, is his object. He sees it in the master. At the same time, self-existence is a real mode of consciousness. But the subservient consciousness as such finds these two moments fall apart. The moment of itself as independent object and the moment of this object as a mode of consciousness, and so its own proper reality. Since, however, the form and the self-existence are for us, or objectively in themselves, one and the same, and since in the notion of independent consciousness the inherent reality is consciousness, the phase of inherent existence, an sich sein, or thinghood, which received its shape and form through labour, is no other substance than consciousness. In this way, we have a new attitude or mode of consciousness brought about. We have now a consciousness which takes itself to be infinitude, or one whose essential nature is a pure process of consciousness. It is one which thinks, or is free self-consciousness. For thinking does not consist in being an abstract ego, but in being an ego which has, at the same time, the significance of inherently existing in itself, or which relates itself to objective reality in such a way that this signifies the self-existence of that consciousness for which it is an object. The object does not, for thinking, proceed by way of presentations or figures, but of notions, conceptions, i.e. of a differentiated reality or essence, which, being in immediate content of consciousness, is nothing distinct from it. What is presented, shaped and constructed, 
and existent as such has the form of being something other than consciousness a notion however is at the same time an existent and this distinction so far as it falls in consciousness itself is its determinate content but in that this content is at the same time conceptually constituted a comprehended content consciousness remains immediately aware within itself of its unity with this determinate existence so distinguished not as in the case of presentation where the consciousness from the first has to take a special note of this idea of the object on the contrary the notion is for me eo ipso and at once my notion in thinking i am free because i am not in another but remain simply and solely in touch with myself and the object which for me is my essential reality is in undivided unity my self-existence and my procedure in dealing with notions is a process within myself it is essential however in this determination of the above attitude of self-consciousness to keep hold of the fact that this attitude is thinking consciousness in general and its object is immediate unity of the self's implicit inherent existence and of its existence explicitly for self this self-same consciousness which repels itself from itself becomes aware of being an element existing in itself but to itself it is this element to begin with only as universal reality in general and not as this essential reality appears when developed in all the manifold details it contains when the process of its being brings out all its fullness and content this freedom of self-consciousness as is well known has been called stoicism in so far as it has appeared as a phenomenon conscious of itself in the course of history of man's spirit its principle is that consciousness is essentially that which thinks is a thinking reality and that anything is really essential for consciousness or is true and good only when consciousness in dealing with it adopts the attitude of a thinking being the manifold self-differentiating expanse of life with all its individuation and complication is the object upon which desire and labour operate this varied activity has now contracted itself into the simple distinction which is found in the pure process of thought what has still essential reality is not a distinction in the sense of a determinate thing or in the shape of a consciousness of a determinate kind of natural existence in the shape of a feeling or again in the form of a desire and in its specific purpose whether that purpose be set up by the conscious desiring or by an extraneous consciousness what has the more essential significance here is solely that distinction which is thought constituted distinction or which when made is not distinguished from me this consciousness in consequence takes a negative attitude towards the relation of lordship and bondage its action in the case of the master results in his not simply having his truth in and through the bondsman and in that of the bondsman not finding his truth in the will of the master and in service the essence of this consciousness is to be free on the throne as well as in fetters throughout all the dependence that attaches to its individual existence and to maintain that stolid lifeless unconcern which persistently withdraws from the movement of existence from effective activity as well as from passive endurance into the simple essentiality of thought stubbornness is that freedom which makes itself secure in a solid singleness and keeps within the sphere of bondage stoicism on the other hand is the freedom which ever comes directly out of that sphere and returns back into pure universality of thought it is a freedom which can come on the scene as a general form of the world spirit only in a time of universal fear and bondage a time too when mental cultivation is universal and has elevated culture to the level of thought now while this self-consciousness finds itself essential reality to be neither something other than itself nor the pure abstraction of ego but ego which has within it otherness in the sense of a thought constituted distinction so this ego in its otherness is turned back directly into self yet this essential nature is at the same time only an abstract reality the freedom of self-consciousness is indifferent towards natural existence and has therefore let the latter go and remain free the reflection is thus duplicated freedom of thought takes only pure thought as its truth 
and this lacks the concrete filling of life. It is therefore merely the notion of freedom, not living freedom itself, for it is, to begin with, only thinking in general, that is its essence, the form as such which has turned away from the independence of things and gone back into itself. Since, however, individuality when acting should show itself to be alive, or when thinking should grasp the living world as a system of thought, there ought to lie in thought itself a content to supply the sphere of the ego, in the former case with what is good, and in the latter true, in order that there should throughout be no other ingredient in what consciousness has to deal with, except the notion which is the real essence. But here, by the way, in which the notion is an abstraction cuts itself off from the multiplicity of things, the notion has no content in itself. The content is a datum, is given. Consciousness no doubt abolishes the content in an external, a foreign existent, by the fact that it thinks it, but its notion is a determinate notion, and this determinateness of the notion is the alien element and notion contains within it. Stoicism, therefore, got embarrassed when, as the expression went, it was asked for the criterion of truth in general, i.e. properly speaking, for a content of thought itself. To this question, what is good and true, it responded by giving again the abstract, contentless thought. The true and good are to consist in reasonableness. But this self-identity of thought is simply once more pure form, in which nothing is determinate. The general terms true and good, wisdom and virtue, with which Stoicism has to stop short, are therefore, in a general way, doubtless elevating. But seeing that they cannot actually, and in fact, reach any expansive content, they soon begin to get wearisome. This thinking consciousness, in the way in which it is thus constituted as abstract freedom, is therefore only incomplete negation of otherness. Withdrawn from existence solely into itself, it has not there fully vindicated itself as the absolute negation of this existence. It holds the content indeed to be only thought, but in doing so, also it takes thought as a specific determinate thought, and at the same time the general character of the content. Scepticism is the realization of that which Stoicism is merely the notion, and is the actual experience of what freedom of thought is. It is in itself and essentially the negative, and must so exhibit itself, with the reflection of self-consciousness into the simple, pure thought of itself, independent existence or permanent determinateness has, in contrast to that reflection, dropped as a matter of fact out of the infinitude of thought. In scepticism, the entire unessentiality and unsubstantiality of this other becomes a reality for consciousness. Thought becomes thinking which wholly annihilates the being of the world with its manifold determinateness, and the negativity of free self-consciousness comes to be, in the case of these manifold forms, which life assumes, real negativity. It is clear from the foregoing that just as Stoicism answers to the notion of independent consciousness, which appears as a relation to lordship and bondage, scepticism on its side corresponds to its realization, to the negative attitude towards otherness, to desire and labor. But if desire and work could not carry out for self-consciousness the process of negation, this polemical attitude towards the manifold substantiality of things will, on the other hand, be successful, because it turns against them as a free self-consciousness, and one complete with itself beforehand, or expressed more definitely, because it has inherent in itself thought or the principle of infinitude, where the independent elements in their distinction from one another are held to be vanishing quantities. The difference, which in the pure thinking of self are only the abstraction of differences, become here the whole of the differences, and every differentiated existent becomes a difference of self-consciousness. With this we get determined the action of scepticism in general, and, owes, and also its mode and nature. It shows the dialectic movement, which is uncertainty, perception and understanding, it shows, too, the unessentiality of that which holds good in the relation of master and servant, and which, for abstract thought itself, passes as determinate. That relation involves, at the same time, a determinate situation, 
in which there are found even moral laws as commands of the sovereign lord the determinations in abstract thought however are scientific notions into which the formal contentless thought expands itself attaching the notion as a matter of fact in merely an external fashion to the existence independent of it and holding as valid only determinate notions albeit they are still pure abstractions dialectic as a negative process taken immediately as it stands appears to consciousness in the first instance as something at the mercy of which it is and which does not exist through consciousness itself in scepticism on the other hand this negative process is a moment of self-consciousness which does not simply find its truth and its reality vanish without self-consciousness knowing how but rather which in the certainty of its own freedom itself lets this other so claiming to be real vanish self-consciousness here allows not only the objective as such to disappear before the negations of scepticism but also its own attitude and relation to the object where the object is held to be objective and rendered valid i e its attitude of perception is also its process of securing what is in danger of being lost viz sophistry with its self-constituted and self-established truth by means of this self-conscious negation self-consciousness procures for itself the certainty of its own freedom brings about the experience of that freedom and thereby raises it to the truth what vanishes is what is determinate the difference which no matter what its nature or whence it comes sets up to be fixed and unchangeable the difference has nothing permanent in it and must vanish before thought because to be differentiated just means not to have being in itself but to have its external nature solely in another thinking however is the insight into this character of what is differentiated it is the negative function in its simple ultimate form sceptical self-consciousness thus discovers in the flux and alternation of all that would stand secure in its presence its own freedom as given by and received from its own self it is aware of being self-thinking thought the unalterable and genuine certainty of itself this certainty does not arise as a result out of something extraneous and foreign which is stowed away inside itself its whole complex development a result which would thus leave behind the process by which it came to be rather consciousness itself is thoroughgoing dialectical restlessness this melee of presentations derived from sense and thought whose differences collapse into oneness and whose identity is similarly again resolved and dissolved for this identity is itself determinateness as contrasted with non-identity this consciousness however as a matter of fact instead of being self-same consciousness is here neither more nor less than an absolutely fortuitous imbroiligo a giddy whirl of perpetually self-creating disorder this is what it takes itself to be for itself maintains and produces this self-impelling confusion hence it even confesses the fact it owns to being an entirely fortuitous individual consciousness a consciousness which is empirical which is directed upon what is admittedly has no reality for it which obeys what in its regard has no essential being which realizes and does what it knows to have no truth but while it passes in this manner for an individual isolated contingent in fact animal life and a lost self-consciousness it also on the contrary again turns itself into universal self-sameness for it is the negativity of all singleness and all difference from this self-identity or rather within its very self it falls back once more into that contingency and that confusion for this very self-directed process of negation has to do solely with what is single and individual and is occupied with what is fortuitous this form of consciousness is therefore the aimless fickleness and instability of going to and fro hither and thither from one extreme of self-consciousness to the other of contingent confused and confusing consciousness it does not itself bring these two thoughts of itself together it finds its freedom at one time in the form of elevation above all the whirling complexity and all the contingency of mere existence and again at another time likewise confessor to falling back on what is unessential and to being taken up in that it lets the unessential content in its thought vanish but in that very act 
is the consciousness of something inessential. It announces absolute disappearance, but the announcement is, and this consciousness is the evanescence expressly announced. It announces the nullity of seeing, hearing, and so on, yet itself sees and hears. It proclaims the nothingness of essential ethical principles, and makes these very truths the sinews of its own conduct. Its deeds and its words belie each other continually, and itself too has the doubly contradictory consciousness of immutability and sameness, and of utter contingency and non-identity with itself. But it keeps asunder the poles of this contradiction within itself, and bears itself towards the contradiction, as it does in its purely negative process in general. If self-sameness is shown to it, it points out unlikeness, non-identity, and when the latter, which it ex expressly mentioned the moment before, is held up to it, it passes on to indicate sameness and identity. Its talk, in fact, is like a squabble amongst self-willed children, one of which says A when the other says B, and again B when the other says A, and who, through being in contradiction with themselves, procure the joy of remaining in contradiction with one another. In scepticism, consciousness gets, in truth, to know itself as a consciousness containing contradiction with itself. From the experience of this proceeds a new attitude which brings the two thoughts together which scepticism holds apart. The want of intelligence which scepticism manifests regarding itself is bound to vanish, because it is in fact one consciousness which possesses these two modes within it. This new attitude, consequently, is one which is aware of being the double consciousness of itself, a self-liberating, unalterable, self-identical, and as utterly self-confounding, self-perverting. And this new attitude is the consciousness of the contradiction within itself. In Stoicism, self-consciousness is the bare and simple freedom of itself. In Scepticism, it realizes itself, negates the other side of determinate existence, but in doing so really doubles itself, and is itself now a duality. In this way, the duplication which previously was divided between the two individuals, the lord and the bondsman, is concentrated into one. Thus we have here that dualizing self-consciousness within itself, which lies essentially in the notion of mind, but the unity of the two elements is not yet present. Hence the unhappy consciousness. The alienated soul, which is the consciousness of self, as a divided nature, a doubled and merely contradictory being. Translator's note. The term Unglicksweiss burst fine is designed in summary expression for the following movement, there being no recognized general term for this purpose, as in the case of Stoicism. The term hardly seems fortunate. With the following analysis should be read Hegel's Philosophy of History, Part 4, Section 2 and 1 and History of Philosophy, Part 2, Introduction. This unhappy consciousness, divided and at variance with itself, must, because this contradiction of its essential nature is felt to be a single consciousness, always have in the one consciousness the other also, and thus must be straightway driven out of each in turn when it thinks it has therein attained to the victory and the rest of unity. Its true return to itself, or reconciliation with itself, will, however, exhibit the notion of mind endowed with a life and existence of its own, because it implicitly involves the fact that, qua single and undivided, it is a double consciousness. It is itself the gazing of one self-consciousness into another, as itself it is both, and the unity of both is easy to own its essence, but objectively and consciously, it is not yet this essence itself, it is not yet the unity of both. Since in the first instance it is the immediate, the implicit unity of both, for it they are not one and the same but opposed, it takes one, namely the simple and unalterable, and essential the other, the manifold and changeable, as the unessential. For it both are realities foreign to each other. Itself, because consciousness of this contradiction, assumes the aspect of changeable consciousness, and is to itself the inessential. But as consciousness of unchangeableness, of the ultimate essence, it must at the same time proceed to free itself from the unessential, i.e. to liberate itself from itself. For though in its own view it is indeed only the changeable, and the unchangeable is foreign and extraneous to it, 
yet itself is simple and therefore unchangeable consciousness of which consequently it is conscious as its essence but still in such wise what itself is again in its own regard is not this essence the position which it assigns to both cannot therefore be an indifference of one to the other i e cannot be an indifference of itself towards the unchangeable rather it is immediately both itself and the relation both assumes the form of a relation of essence to the non-essential so that this latter has to be cancelled but since both are to it equally essential and are contradictory it is only the conflicting contradictory process in which opposites do not come to rest in its own opposite but produces itself therein afresh merely as an opposite here then is a struggle against an enemy victory over whom really means being worsted where to have attained one's result is really to lose it in the opposite consciousness of life of its existence and action is merely pain and sorrow over this existence and activity for therein consciousness finds only consciousness of its opposite as its essence and of its own nothingness elevating itself beyond this it passes to the unchangeable but this elevation is itself this same consciousness it is therefore immediately conscious of the opposite viz of itself as single individual particular the unchangeable which comes to consciousness is in that very fact at the same time affected by particularity and it is only present with this latter instead of particularity having been abolished in consciousness of immutability it only continues to appear there still in this process however consciousness experiences just this appearance of particularity in the unchangeable and of the unchangeable in particularity consciousness becomes aware of particularity in general in the immutable essence and at the same time there finds its own particularity for the truth of this process is precisely that the double consciousness is one and single this unity becomes a fact to it but in the first instance the unity is one which the diversity of both factors is still the dominant feature owing to this consciousness has before it the threefold way in which particularity is connected with unchangeableness in one form it comes before itself as opposed to the unchangeable essence and is thrown back to the beginning of that struggle which is from first to last the principle constituting the entire situation at another time it finds the unchangeable appearing in the form of particularity so that the latter is an embodiment of unchangeableness into which in consequence the entire form of existence passes in the third case it discovers itself to be this particular fact in the unchangeable this first unchangeable is taken to be merely the alien external being which passes sentence on particular existence the second unchangeable is a form or mode of particularity like itself the unchangeable becomes in the third place spirit geist has the joy of finding itself therein and becomes aware within itself that its particularity has been reconciled with the universal what is set forth here is a mode and relation of the unchangeable came to light as the experience through which self-consciousness passes into its unhappy state of diremption this experience now doubtless not its one-sided process for it itself is unchangeable consciousness and this latter consequently is a particular consciousness as well and the process is as much a process of that unchangeable consciousness which makes its appearance there as certainty as the other for that movement is carried on in these moments an unchangeable now opposed to the particular in general then being itself particular opposed to the other particular and finally at one with it but this consideration so far as it is our affair is here out of place for thus far we have only had to do with unchangeableness as unchangeableness of consciousness which for that reason is not true immutability but is still affected with the opposite we have not had before us the unchangeable per se and by itself we do not therefore know how this latter will conduct itself what has here so far come to light is merely this that to consciousness which is our object here the determinations above indicated appear in the unchangeable
For this reason, then, the unchangeable consciousness also preserves in its very form and being the character and fundamental features of diremption and separate self-existence as against the particular consciousness. For the latter, it is thus altogether a contingency, a mere chance event, that the unchangeable receives the form of particularity, just as the particular consciousness merely happens to find itself opposed to the unchangeable, and therefore has the relation per naturam. Finally, that it finds itself in the unchangeable appears to the particular consciousness to be brought about partly, no doubt, by itself, or to take place for that reason that itself is particular, but this union, both as regards its origin as well as its being, appears particularly also due to the unchangeable, and the opposition remains within this unity itself. In point of fact, though the unchangeable assuming definite form, the beyond, as a moment, has not only remained, but really is more securely established. For if the remote beyond seems indeed brought closer to the individual by this particular form of realization, on the other hand, it is henceforward fixedly opposed to the individual, a sensuous, impervious unit, with all the hard resistance of what is actual. The hope of becoming one therewith must remain a hope, i.e. without fulfilment, without present fruition, for between the hope and fulfilment there stands precisely the absolute contingency, or immovable indifference, which is involved in the very assumption of determinate shape and form, the basis and foundation of hope. By the nature of this existent unit, through the particular reality it has assumed and adopted, it comes about of necessity that in course of time becomes a thing in the past, something that has been somewhere far away and absolutely remote, it remains. If, at the beginning, the bare notion of the sundered consciousness, involved in the characteristic of seeking to cancel it qua particular consciousness, and become the unchangeable consciousness, the direction its effort henceforth takes is rather that of cancelling its relation to the pure unchangeable without shape or embodied form, and of adopting only the relation to the unchangeable which has form and shape. Translator's Note The Historic Christ as Worshipped, e.g. in the Medieval Church For the oneness of the particular consciousness with the unchangeable is henceforth its object and the essential reality for it is just as the mere notion of the essential object was merely the formless abstract unchangeable. And the relation found in this absolute disruption, characteristic of its notion, is now what it has to turn away from. The external relation, however, primarily adopted to the formed and embodied unchangeable, as being an alien extraneous reality, must be transmuted and raised to that of complete and thoroughgoing fusion and identification. The process through which the unessential consciousness strives to attain this oneness is itself a triple process in accordance with the threefold character of the relation which this consciousness takes up to its transcendent and remote reality embodied in specific form. In one it is a pure consciousness, at another time it is a particular individual who takes up towards actuality the attitude characteristic of desire and labour and in the third place it is consciousness of its self-existence, its existence for itself. We have now to see how these three modes of being are found and are constituted in that general relation. In the first place, then, regarded as pure consciousness, the unchangeable embodied in a definite historical form seems, since it is an object for pure consciousness to be established, as it is in its self-subsistent reality. But this, its reality in and for itself, has not yet come to light, as we already remarked. Were we to be in consciousness as it is in itself and for itself, this would certainly have to come about not from the side of consciousness, but from the unchangeable. But this being so, its presence here is brought about through consciousness only in a one-sided way to begin with, and just for that reason it is not found in a perfect and genuine form, but constantly weighed and encumbered with imperfection with an opposite. But although the unhappy consciousness does not possess this actual presence, it has at the same time transcended pure thought, so far as this is the abstract thought of Stoicism, which turns away from particulars altogether, and again the merely restless thought of scepticism, so far, in fact, as this is merely particularity in the sense of aimless contradiction and the restless process of contradictory thought.
it has gone beyond both of these it brings and keeps together pure thought and particular existence but has not yet risen to that level of thinking where the particularity of consciousness is harmoniously reconciled with pure thought itself it rather stands midway at the point where abstract thought comes into contact with the particularity of consciousness qua particularity itself is this act of contact it is the union of pure thought and particularity moreover this thinking individuality or pure thought exists for it and for it too the unchangeable is essentially a particular existence but that this its object the unchangeable which assumes essentiality in the form of particularity is its own self the self which is particularity of consciousness this is not established for it in this first condition consequently in which we treat it as pure consciousness it takes up towards its object an attitude which is not that of thought but rather since it is itself pure thinking particularity and its object is just this pure thought but pure thought is not their relation to one another as such it so to say merely gives itself up to thought devotes itself to thinking and is the state of devotion and act its thinking as such is no more than the passing clang of ringing bells or a cloud of warm incense a kind of thinking in terms of music that doesn't get the length of notions which would be the sole imminent objective mode of thought this boundless pure inward feeling comes to have indeed its object but this object does not make its appearance in conceptual form and therefore comes on the scene as something external and foreign here we have the inward movement of pure emotion gimoth, which feels itself but feels itself the bitterness of soul diremption it is the movement of an infinite yearning which is assured that its nature is a pure emotion of this kind a pure thought which thinks itself as a particularity a yearning that is certain of being known and recognized by this object for the very reason that this object thinks itself as a particularity at the same time however this nature is unattainable beyond which in being seized escapes or rather has already escaped the beyond has already escaped for it is in part the unchangeable thinking itself as particularity and consciousness therefore attains itself therein immediately attains itself but as something opposed to the unchangeable instead of grasping the real nature consciousness merely feels and has fallen back upon itself since then in thus attaining itself consciousness cannot prevent itself from being this opposite it has merely laid hold of what is unessential instead of having seized true reality thus just as on one side when striving to find out itself the essentially real it only lays hold of its own divided state of existence so too on the other side it cannot grasp that other the essence as particular or as concrete that other cannot be found where it is sought for it is meant to be just a beyond that is which cannot be found when looked for as particular it is not a universal a thought constituted particularity not notion but particular in the sense of an object or a concrete actual an object of immediate sense consciousness of sense certainty and for that reason it is one which has disappeared consciousness therefore can only become upon the grave of its own life but since this is in itself an actuality and since it is contrary to the nature of actuality to afford a lasting possession the presence even of that tomb is merely the source of trouble toil and struggle a fight which must be lost but since consciousness has found out by experience that the grave of its actual unchangeable being has no concrete actuality that the vanished particularity qua vanished is not true particularity it will give up looking for the unchangeable particular existence as something actual or will cease trying to hold on to what has thus vanished only so is it capable of finding particularity in a true form a form that is universal in the first instance however the withdrawal of the emotional life into itself is to be taken in such a way that this life of feeling in its own regard has actuality qua particular existence it is pure emotion which for us or per se has found itself and satiated itself 
for although it is no doubt aware in feeling that the ultimate reality is cut off from it yet in itself this feeling is self-feeling it has felt the object of its own pure feeling and the object is its own self it thus comes forward here as a self-feeling or as something actual in its own account in this return to self we find appearing in its second attitude the condition of desire and labour which ensures for consciousness the inner certainty of its own self which as we saw it has obtained by the process of cancelling and enjoying the alien external reality existence in the form of independent things the unhappy consciousness however finds itself merely desiring and toiling it is not consciously and directly aware that so to find itself rests upon the inner certainty of itself and that its feeling of real being is this self-feeling since it does not in its own view have that certainty its inner life remains still a shattered certainty of itself that confirmation of its own existence which it would receive through work and enjoyment is therefore just as tottering and insecure in other words it must consciously nullify the certification of its own being so as to find therein confirmation indeed but confirmation only of what it is for itself viz of its disunion the actual reality on which desire and work are directed is from the point of view of this consciousness no longer something in itself null and void something merely to be destroyed and consumed but rather something like that of consciousness itself a reality broken in sunder which is in only one respect essentially null but in another sense is also a consecrated world this reality is a form and embodiment of the unchangeable for the latter has conserved in itself particularity and because qua unchangeable it is universal its particularity as a whole has the significance of all actuality if consciousness were for itself an independent consciousness and reality were taken to be and for itself of no account then consciousness would attain in work and enjoyment the feeling of its own independence by the fact that its consciousness would be that which cancels reality but since this reality is taken to be the form and shape of the unchangeable consciousness is itself unable to cancel that reality on the contrary seeing that consciousness manages to nullify reality and to obtain enjoyment this must come about through the unchangeable itself when it disposes of its own form and shape and delivers this up for consciousness to enjoy consciousness on its part appears here likewise as actual though at the same time as internally shattered and this diremption shows itself in the course of toil and enjoyment to break up into relation to reality or existence for itself and into an existence in itself that relation to actuality is the process of alteration or acting the existence for itself which belongs to the particular consciousness as such but therein it is also itself this aspect belongs to the unchangeable beyond this aspect consists in faculties and powers an external gift which the unchangeable here hands over for consciousness to make use of in its action accordingly consciousness in the first instance has its being in the relation of the two extremes on the one side it takes its stand as the active present and opposed to it stands passive reality both in relation to each other but also both withdrawn into unchangeable and firmly established by themselves from both sides therefore there is detached merely a superficial element to constitute their opposition they are only opposed at the surface and the play of opposition the one to the other takes place there the extreme passive reality is sublated by the active extreme actuality can however on its own side be sublated only because its own changeless essence sublates it it repels itself from itself and hands over to the mercy of the active extreme what is thus repelled active force appears as the power wherein actual reality is dissolved for that reason however this consciousness to which the inherent reality or ultimate essence is an other regards this power which is the way it appears when active as the beyond that which lies remote from itself instead therefore of returning to its activity into itself and instead having confirmed itself as a fact for its own self consciousness reflects back in this process action into the other extreme which is thereby represented as purely universal 
as absolute might from which the movement in every direction started and which is the essential life of the self-disintegrating extremes as they first appeared and the process of change as well in that the unchangeable consciousness condemns its specific shape and form and abandons it entirely while on the other hand the individual consciousness gives thanks i e denies itself the satisfaction of being conscious of its independence and refers its essential substance of its action to the beyond and not to itself by these two moments in which both parts give themselves up the one to the other there certainly arises in consciousness a sense of its own unity with the unchangeable but at the same time this unity is affected with division it's again broken within itself and out of this unity there once more comes the opposition of universal and particular for consciousness no doubt in appearance renounces the satisfaction of its self-feeling but it gets the actual satisfaction of that feeling for it has been desire work and enjoyment qua consciousness it has willed and acted and enjoyed its thanks similarly in which it recognizes the other extreme as its true reality and cancels itself is its very own act which counterbalances the action of the other extreme and meets with a like act the benefit handed over if the former yields to consciousness merely its superficial content consciousness expresses thanks all the same and when it gives up its own action i e its very essence it properly speaking does more thereby than the other which only renounces an outer surface the entire process therefore is reflected into extreme of particularity not merely in actual desire labour and enjoyment but even in the expression of thanks where the reverse seems to take place consciousness feels itself therein in its particular individual and does not let itself be deceived by the semblance of its renunciation for the real truth of that procedure is that it has not given itself up what has come about is merely the double reflection into both extremes and the result is to repeat the cleavage into the opposed consciousness of the unchangeable and the consciousness of a contrasted opposite in the shape of willing performing enjoying and of self-renunciation itself or in general of self-existent particularity with this has come to light the third attitude in the movement of this consciousness an attitude which follows from the second and is such as in truth has proved itself independent by its willing and by its performance in the first situation we had only a notion of actual consciousness the inward emotion which is not yet real in action and enjoyment the second is this actualization as an external expression of action and enjoyment with the return out of this stage however it is that which has got to know itself as a real and effective consciousness or that which truth consists in being in and for itself but herein the enemy is discovered in its special and most peculiar form in the battle of emotion this individual consciousness has a sense of being merely a tune an abstract moment in work and enjoyment which are the realization of the unsubstantiated existence it can readily forget itself and the consciousness of its own proper life found in this realization is overborne by grateful recognition but this overthrow of its proper distinctiveness is in truth return of consciousness to itself and moreover into itself as the genuine reality this third attitude wherein this genuine reality is one term consists in so relating this reality to absolute universal being as to show it to be mere nothingness translators note the conception of the nothingness of the individual in the sight of god End translator's note the course of this relation we have still to consider to begin with as regards the contrasted relation of consciousness in which reality is taken to be immediately naught its actual performance thus becomes a doing of nothing at all its enjoyment becomes a feeling of its own unhappiness in consequence activity and enjoyment lose all universal content and significance for in that case they would have substantiality of their own and both withdraw into the state of particularity to which consciousness is directed in order to cancel them consciousness discovers itself as this concrete particular in the functions of animal life these latter instead of being performed unconsciously and naturally as something which is per se of no significance and can acquire no importance and essential value for spirit these latter since it is in them that the enemy is seen in his proper and peculiar shape are rather an object of strenuous concern and strenuous occupation 
and become precisely the most important consideration. Translator's note, asceticism, and translator's note. Since, however, this enemy creates itself in its very defeat, consciousness, by giving the enemy a fixedness of being and of meaning, gets away from him and finds itself constantly defiled. And since at the same time this object of its exertions, instead of being something essential, is the very meanest, instead of being a universal, is the very merest particular, we have here before us a personality confined with its narrow self and its petty activity, a personality brooding over itself as an unfortunate as it is pitiably destitute. But all the same, both of these, both the feeling of its misfortune and the poverty of its own action, are points of connection to which to attach the consciousness of its unity with the unchangeable. For the attempted immediate destruction of its actual existence is effected through the thought of the unchangeable, and takes place in this relation with the unchangeable. The immediate relation constitutes the essence of the negative process in which this consciousness directs itself against its particularity of being, which, however, qua relation, is at the same time in itself positive, and will bring this unity to light as an objective fact for this consciousness itself. This immediate relation is consequently connected to its inferential process, Schluss, in which particularity, establishing itself first in opposition to the inherent essence, is bound together and united with this other term, only through a third term. Through this middle term, the one extreme unchangeable consciousness has a being for the unessential consciousness, in which, at the same time, it is also involved in the latter likewise, it has a being for the former, solely through the middle term, and this middle term is thus one which presents both extremes to one another, and acts as the minister of each in turn dealing with the other. This medium is a self-conscious being, for it is an action mediating consciousness as such. The content of this action is the destruction and annihilation which consciousness has in view of its dealing with particularity. In the middle term, then, this consciousness gets freed from action and enjoyment in the sense of its own action and enjoyment. It puts away from itself, qua self-existent extreme, the substance of its will, and throws on the mediating term or the ministering agency, the priesthood, its own proper freedom of decision, and herewith the guilt of its own act. This mediator, being in direct communication with the unchangeable being, renders service by advising what is just and right. The act, since it follows upon obedience to a deliverance enunciated by another, ceases as regards the performance or the willing of the act to be the agent's own proper deed. There is still left, however, to the subordinate consciousness its objective aspect, namely the fruit of its labour and enjoyment. These, therefore, it casts away as well, and just as it declaimed its own will, so it condemns such reality as it received in work and in enjoyment. It renounces these partly as being the accomplished truth of its self-conscious independence, since it seeks to do something quite foreign to itself, thinking and speaking, what for it has no sense or meaning, partly too as being external property, since it demits somewhat of the possession acquired through its toil. It also gives up the enjoyment, since with its fastings and its mortifications, it once more absolutely denies itself that enjoyment. Through these moments, the negative abandonment first of its own right and power of decision, then of its property and enjoyment, and finally the positive moment of carrying on what it does not understand, it obtains completely and in truth the consciousness of inner and outer freedom, or reality in the sense of its own existence for itself. It has the certainty of having in truth stripped itself of the ego, and of having tuned its immediate self-consciousness into a thing, into an objective external existence. It could ensure its self-renunciation and self-abandonment solely by this real and vital sacrifice of itself. For only thereby is the deception got rid of which lies in inner acknowledgement of gratitude through heart, sentiment and tongue, an acknowledgement which indeed disclaims all power of independent self-existence and extribes this power to a gift from above, but in this very disclaimer retains for itself its own proper and peculiar life, outwardly in it the possession it does not resign, inwardly in the consciousness of the decision which itself has resolved upon, and consciousness of its own self-constituted content, which it has not exchanged for a content coming from without, and filling it with meaningless ideas and phrases. But in the sacrifice actually accomplished, while consciousness has cancelled the action in its own act, 
it has also implicitly demitted and put off its unhappy condition. Yet that demission has implicitly taken place. It's affected by the other term of the logical process, Schluss, here involved, the term which is the inherent and ultimate reality. That sacrifice of the subordinate term, however, was at the same time not a one-sided action. It involves the action of the other. For giving up one's own will is only in one aspect negative. In principle, or in itself, it is at the same time positive, positing and affirming the will as another and specifically affirming this will not as a particular, but as a universal. This consciousness takes the positive significance of the negatively affirmed particular will to the will of the other extreme. This will, which, because it is simply another for consciousness, assumes the form of advice or counsel, not through itself, but through its third term, the mediator. Hence its will certainly becomes, for consciousness, universal will, inherent and essential will, but it is not itself in its own view this inherent reality. The giving up of its own will, as particular, is not taken by it to be in principle the positive element of universal will. Similarly, its surrender of possession and enjoyment has merely the same negative significance, and the universal, which it thereby comes to find, is, in its view, not its own doing proper. This unity of objectivity and independent self-existence which lies in the notion of action and which therefore comes for consciousness to be the essential reality and object, as this is not taken by consciousness to be the principle of its action, neither does it become an object for consciousness directly and through itself, rather it makes the mediating minister explain this still halting certainty, that its unhappy state is only implicitly the reverse, i.e., it is only implicitly action bringing self-satisfaction in this act, or blessed enjoyment, that its pitiable action too is only implicitly the reverse, namely the absolute action, that in principle action is only really action when it is the action of some particular individual, but for itself action and its own concrete action remain something miserable and insignificant, its enjoyment, pain and sublation of these, positively considered, remain a mere beyond. But in this object, where it finds its own action and existence, qua this particular consciousness, to be inherently existence and action, as such, there has arisen the idea of reason, of the certainty of consciousness, is, in its particularity, inherently and essentially absolute, or is all reality. End of chapter 4b, recording by Morris in Alzey, Bedfordshire.